This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 28, Episode 1. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to Good you, morning. Matt. Good morning. Should I tell folks about the big show? I've been looking all week, looking for it all week. All right, well, here you go. Now, this week, the big news was mm. Ubuntu Edge was announced, and Anytime. it's Canonical's kind of out there attempt to bring a crowdsourced phone to the market. So we're going to talk about that, the ramifications of a project like this, mm. and really what we kind of see, th where things going, if we think it's going to make it, and the goals of a project like this. We'll be discussing that in, a, in the yep. second half of today's show. Good stuff. And then in Slash Etsy, we're going to give you our first hands-on with React OS. Mm. You know, React OS has, has been around for a very, very long like time. 12 we're, years or we're, something? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get into some of its history yeah. later in the show. But what's funny is we've never really talked about it very much in mm. the seven-year history of this show. That's true. But we've gotten a ton of requests to look at it over the years. So finally, we're answering that. So that'll be in Slash Etsy. We also have a bunch of great feedback mm. in this week's episode. And I have an update on the uh, Drives for Jupiter campaign. But first, it's the news and our picks. Right on. Which is a uh, little start. That's where you are. You are here in the okay. picks segment. Super. Matt, I yes. asked last week, because last week we did, you know, Modern Society runs live. I remember. And that. I said, how can I compete with that? We got to bring it back to home. We got to bring it local. Got to bring it in, right? That's Absolutely. What I kind of bring rain, the community. rain it back yeah. in, right? Yeah. Well, Anthony helped us out this week. Nice. Anthony's duvet runs Linux. Yeah, that's right. His blanket <laughs> on his bed. You see, he's got Tux Penguins and uh, the Ubuntu logo. Now, this. And actually, the Ubuntu logo matches very nice with the uh, wood uh, drawers, which are on both sides. Someone had it. Someone knew what they were the, doing it. Yeah. You know, I also appreciate the fact <laughs> that there's, like, various tux. Multiple different tuxes, too. Yeah, yeah. There's even a Mac tux. Wow, oh, look yeah, at everybody is. in the family, right? Absolutely. So, uh, now, this is stretching the limits, but I believe, in the spirit, that blanket does run Linux. And I thought, there's no that. way, sort of, to reset the palette. You know when you go into a stinky candle shop, and, like, you're smelling all the candles, and they have, like, these little jars of coffee beans out there right. to reset the nose? Or if you're drinking wine, you know, they'll have something to reset oh, yeah. the palate. Yeah. That, we just reset our Runs Linux palette with this. I think, I, this I, I think that's working for me. And, you know, Tux is keeping you toasty at night. So yeah, nice. he, he sent in a little note. He says, uh, hi, Chris and Matt. I thought I'd send you a pic of my Runs Linux segment for the show. You wanted examples of Linux in the real world, so here's my duvet. <laughs> yes, that's right. My bed is Linux powered. Okay, so it's not actually a computer, but Tux does keep me warm at night. I think if, it qualifies. Aw, look at this. It's my mom who made the duvet for nice. me as I converted my parents to Linux, too. Mom's laptop runs Ubuntu, and Dad has an Android tablet. So he's half he's halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, he says, keep up the great work on the show. What a Thanks, thoughtful Anthony. gift from your mom. That's awesome. Yeah, that was really good. We've got a few other runs Linuxes that we'll cool. be featuring as it goes on. But yeah, very cool. All right, Matt. Well, uh, the uh, picks this week, one one I'm really curious to hear your feedback on yeah. because I haven't tried it myself, but you've picked it out. Yep. And uh, you experimented with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then, then we got a pick that covers a little bit of territory the show has never really gotten into, even though it's totally up your guys' alley. Yes. So, And I got a bonus pick, too, on top of all of that. Woo. But first, Matt, it's time to say thank you to our sponsor this week. Go That's GoDaddy.com. Go, Daddy. Go, Daddy. Go, Daddy. Go, Daddy. Go, 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 daddy. go daddy. So GoDaddy.com, last, I think it was the week or last week, we, uh, we read the domain about the guy who uh, made the custom domain for his uh, wedding invitation. Which right? is brilliant. I mean, what a great real-life uh, approach. And we got that code Linux249 when you're checking out over yeah. at GoDaddy.com. I mean, we're talking, it's a crazy good deal. You can get a, you can get a .com, a freaking .com. It's, that's real estate on the internet, that's people. Right. You can get that for $2.49. Well, I, I loved this sort of uh, email, though. He, uh, Dan sent this in a little while ago, yeah. but I just thought this was great. It sort of fit with our last week's email. Sure. He said, uh, this is Dan Kay here. He says, uh, I just used the code Linux249 for a domain name registration to use a simple .com name to forward a friend's confusing wedding wire URL. Nice. Hey, That's smart. This is, so this is one of the things that I think people maybe underappreciate with this Linux249 yep. deal, and it's probably going to expire at the end of the month, so act quick while you can because that's right. very fastly approaching. You can take, a, with, with, once you register uh, a .com with Linux 249, it is just a matter of three or four simple clicks to have that .com redirect to any more complicated URL you want. Like if you oh, yeah. go to jblive.fm, that, that is a very short URL, that jblive.fm. Yeah, it's incredibly great. short. You can put it right in your mobile device for yeah. the radio streaming. But if you actually watch, all, that is going to GoDaddy, and GoDaddy does a very nice HTTP redirect for me 
it then sends it to the actual 128 kilobit MP3 nice. stream. That's and, cool. And I and I just log into GoDaddy at any point, and they have a very nice admin control panel, and I just change the URL that, that points to, and within seconds, it's updated, and I love people that. are now going to the new destination. And it's not overly complicated to set up. I mean, it's stupid simple. I mean, it's really, really nice. Absolutely. And what a great thing to do for your friends, your family, maybe various events. Maybe you got a family reunion coming Dude, up. Dude, that's perfect for that. Yeah. Or, you know what? Be a pro like Cheese Bacon in the chat room. Cheese Bacon uh, used our code go 32 off 4 yeah. Go32 off 4 Go32 off 2 Sorry. Off go32 two, yep. off 2 I can't remember which month it is, Matt. No, he, saved, it, it, he saved 32%. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Good stuff. I know. Yeah. It's, it I is. Really, I really it. appreciate GoDaddy's longtime support of Linux Absolutely. Action Show. And you guys out there who support our sponsors right. to let them know that you appreciate them keeping us on the air. You it's sort of like this circle of life. Yeah. And don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk circle. Mm -mm. Be a circle of life. No of jerk. podcast life. No jerk circles. No jerk circles, guys. Go use our code Linux249 when you check out at GoDaddy.com and uh, save yourself some cash. Also, we've got that very limited... Probably going to wrap up by the end of the month as well. Uh, free private registration when you check out. That's a score yeah. right there. So go me. go use the uh, free five checkout code when you check out over at GoDaddy. Previces. Go 32 off two, Linux 249, and free five when you check out over at GoDaddy.com. Woohoo! Um. All right, Matt. Yeesh. Let's talk about Droid Cam Wireless. This Yeesh. is an interesting Android app pick. If I'm understanding, I haven't gotten a chance to try it. Yep. I loaded it on my HTC One, but if I understand correctly, it turns my HTC One's camera into a webcam. Yeah, essentially you have a client on your on your uh, main PC and you know your laptop, whatever you got, and then of course you have your your mobile in this case running Android. Okay. And so you, you're basically your Android phone then will in turn become the camera or the webcam for say something like Skype and it, or whatever. Now does it work under the uh, GNU slash Linux operating system? It does. System? Yeah. It does. Yeah. It does. Okay. yeah, they have a client for that. So they have um, like a deb or what? Uh, I test now. I did the testing on my uh, on my uh, actual Windows PC. However, they do have a, a Linux client that's okay. reported to work really well, um, and I ch I did check that out because I was kind of last minute in it, but it all yeah. checked out really well. So what's cool now? Here's a use case scenario as to why you care. Okay. Okay. You got a laptop. You were cheap, and you decided I don't need no stinking webcam in this laptop. And then someone wants to have a video Skype with you. Oh, that stinks. Okay. Well, I got a great connection, but I'm right. lacking a webcam. Right. I don't want to dangle some little dangly thing over the side of it because that just looks weird with the cord and all that. But you got yourself a phone. Prop your phone. Well, set yourself up. Boom, you know, the other thing I like about it too is yeah. you could do like. Um, I mean, you could move it a little more than totally. you can a webcam. So you could be like live streaming That's or right. Skyping to somebody and like showing them a room or... Real estate agents. I mean, you know, this practical uh, use case scenario. So I see it know. starts a server that runs That's on right. port 4747 yep. and then you just connect to that. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's really a really simple but brilliant idea. Yeah, here I mean, it is running under Linux right here. Scenarios. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, and I checked out the reports on it. It looked I really see. nice. So, so uh, cool. you used our little software client, and yep. it connects to that port, and the, it represents a USB camera it's to wild. the operating system. Exactly. And so, like in Skype, you would just literally select that camera, and wham, bam, bam, you're all set. That's awesome. It's but, a really great and pick. since it And it does it via Wi-Fi, it so does. you could actually be, like, walking around the house, or... Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you could Skype Grandma... Uh, so this is actually so you know. Uh, so, oh yeah, now you're getting it. This yeah. Thursday, my, this Thursday morning before text nap, my wife had our third baby girl, mm -hmm. our our second daughter, third child. Yeah, and th everybody wants to see pictures. Oh, of course, everybody right. wants to come over. Yep, yep, yep. And the house is a mess because I'm the only one keeping it clean, right. and uh, I have two younger children who are tornadoes. And having a bunch of folks come over all at once can be yeah. it's it's a it's a lot of stuff. So, so I could yeah. I could I have Wi-Fi through the whole house. Sure. I could start it up on this and then Skype people. That's awesome. And see, that's what's awesome is no one has to get up or get in front of a computer. They can just do their thing. And, and it's free, and, which yeah, is really cool, too. Badass, yeah. I like that. I wonder if, jeez, uh, I'm going to play with this. Because really this cool. could be an interesting way to even live stream on remote location. That's what I was thinking when I found right? that. It's like, ooh. If I we had a little Wi-Fi yeah, network, yeah. you could have, like, picture us yep. at Linux Fest Northwest. You could have, even if it was just one of the machines, you could have somebody right. that was getting crowd shots. Mm -hmm. And we could have all of that piped right back and to And in here. their latest, uh, latest release, there was some issues with the Node initially, but they have since been fixed. So it should be working for just about everybody. Cool. All right. Very good. Yeesh. So that's Droid Cam, and it's free, and we'll have that Woo. linked in the show notes. If uh, I also got a little bonus pick for you guys for Android. Bonus pick. Kind of, sort of, for Android. It's actually for your desktop or your oh, laptop or maybe that old triple E PC you have sitting that's around. That's right. That old ancient thing I use. Yeah. <laughs> this is Android x86, uh -huh. and they just released the new 4.3 oh. Jelly Bean. So the, the uh, OS that uh, Google just pushed out to all of the Nexus owners. I need to try that more because, I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's you compelling to me. Yeah. Load it right in VirtualBox or, oh, put it on right. a, or put it on a netbook. They've right. got an ISO. I, d I just downloaded it. Um, I, I don't think you could uh, dual boot that. 
It's just not even very big. Oh, I'm not. I don't have my NFS share mounted. But uh, I downloaded it. It's like yeah. it's like 100 megabytes of an ISO image. Oh, and, that's nothing. Uh, yeah, and you get Android. You can play with the latest 4.3, and you don't even have to have a Nexus device. You could probably even toss that on a USB drive. They, they include uh, also a download, so you can get Firefox loaded. You know, I don't oh. think you're going to get all of the Play Store and all that. Probably stuff. not. I can't see. Yeah, but, but that's okay. It's kind of like Android without all the spying. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Privacy intact, folks. I keyed. I keyed. You guys. I keyed. Uh, all right, now uh, I've got uh, my desktop pick. I'm pretty Dude. excited about this. You this know, is cool. People who watch the video version have picked up on something that folks that listen to the audio version haven't noticed. Mm -hmm. And that's because I really haven't talked about it very much, but I switched from GNOME 3 to KDE 4, 10, and change. And that was a, a, a pretty monumental change that's for you. That's a big change. And yeah. I've, been, I've been, like, I tried to Unity it up. I tried to, like, recreate the right. Unity UI, and I just I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so now I'm back to one bar. But one of the things I've changed because of resource use, I don't know, I feel like the Plasma widgets, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be honest, I run a lot of them. Yeah. I feel like they're heavy. And I, had, I think they're heavy if you, especially once you get past two. Yeah, you're, you're really, you're definitely. They weigh out pretty quick. Yeah. Well, and I had like a whole bunch. Of oh yeah, yeah. I totally. had like I had like half my screen of, of right. widgets, and then when you hooked up my second, <laughs> when I hooked up my second monitor, a whole bunch of more widgets showed <laughs> up. And I still am using some. Yeah. Uh, so I decided, all right, I need to try Conky. Yeah. I I know about Conky forever. I just it's something I've never really just sat down and played with before, yeah. and. If you're not familiar with Conky, Conky's awesome, and one of the things it does a little differently than, say, the Plasma widgets or G-Desklets or, or whatever, is uh, it's actually writing right through X11 as an X window right That's to the why desktop. It's not, yeah, because I know like G-Desklets yeah. was terrible. But yeah, I, yeah, so it's 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 a little it's a little uh, more uh, closer to the X stack, mm -hmm. and also just the, the way like you know it's very text based and the yeah. config is very straightforward. Uh, and, it's got and great options too. And Conky is obviously beloved in the Arch community too, which sort of I think finally brought it into focus for me was um, so many Arch folks yeah. use it. And uh, so I decided to give it a spin here on my KDE setup. But now you longtime Conky users are going to hate that I'm mentioning this. But just for somebody that wanted to get started, and I thought maybe for other folks that might want to yeah. get started too, I came across Conky Manager a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And at first it was only available for Ubuntu, but now they've uh, they've thrown it up on uh, GitHub and our launch pad, and they've got a, cool. they've got a uh, Arch repo. It's in the AUR. Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So it's called Conky Manager, and it gives you a graphical mm. front end for setting up and configuring Conky widgets. And it's very easy to use, and you can go in and you can select which widget you want and define where it's well, going to live awesome. on your desktop, its size, the transparency. You can also import other yeah. theme packs. You can just bring in full packs. They include a bunch of really good Conky themes. Nice. Uh, well, it looks fantastic. Yeah, don't those look great? In fact, you know, why don't I show you? So, and there you go. They have a PPA available, okay. and it's also in uh, the uh, Arch user repository. Oh, nice. and I love the fact manager. that they actually give you the code for that, too. Yeah, oh, right there, there on the page. Bam! Yep, which we'll have that linked. Uh, so um, I'm going to run it for you. What do you think? I want to see it. So it's called Conky Manager. And now you said some people might not like that. Why, why would someone have a problem with something that makes life easier? Ah, so um, oh, thanks oh. for asking that. That's a good question. Uh, it doesn't use the traditional Conky configuration structure. So okay. normally Conky, you, the way when you configure it by hand, mm -hmm. you have a .conky rc right. file in sure. your home directory, and you just throw everything in there. All of the tutorials online tell you how to use that. Yeah, everything, right. you know, all the wiki pages. How to. This doesn't use that file. This oh, creates so a .config folder, okay. then a Conky manager folder, yeah. and all of the Conky widgets and stuff that you use this manager for, they all are configured and managed in there. Now, that's good and bad, because that means you can use this to set up something. Sure. You could then move that into the actual Conky config and then just run regular Conky. I'm actually, I'm, I'm just trying sticking with this. Uh, yeah. It also, you know, automatically sets up run Conky at system startup, and uh, it, it automatically detects which desktop environment you're running, so it intelligently places that auto start file where it needs to. It's, I mean, it sounds like it's a real advantage to go this route. I mean, yeah. for I myself, mean, anyway. especially if you're just dipping your toes. Like, all right, yeah. so you're just kind of playing around. Uh, let's see here. Let's play with something. Let's see. Uh, this is a. This is. There's. There's all kinds of uh, um, different like little uh, widgets Cal that comes. Cal that's the with. what the MP3 player. Cool. Yeah. I'll turn this on there, and it's a big clock you see oh, right there on my... okay. And then when I go in here, wow. I can say, now I can go edit the options for that particular one. So that's called Cowon. Mm -hmm. So I go in here, and I find Cowon Conky thingy. And then I can... Sp and then see, now it lights up. So only oh. that one's active, so I, don't, so I know which one I'm editing, right? Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and then I can tell it where to go. So I can say, put it, put it up on the top right, right, put it on the top left. You know, I can, I can specify that kind of stuff and apply that and then move it where I want it. I can set the transparency and things like oh, that. Wow. So yeah, that's called Conky Manager, and I it like it. Yeah. It lets you get playing real quick and easy. And then when I'm done with that widget, I just turn it off, and it goes away. I love that I can get I can get wonky with Conky right yeah. off the bat, right? You can get wonky with Conky, wonky and with uh, so I'm running. Let's see there. Can you see it? Like, yeah, you can yeah, see the wide go. shot. I got it right there at the top. It says, you know, there's my kernel, 
upgraded to 3103 this weekend. So yeah, I did, I did as well. I, I'm yeah. really liking 310, actually. It's pretty, yeah. pretty spiffy. Yeah, and, I, and it, you know, very nicely, and uh, I, feel, I feel like it takes very low resources. Mm -hmm. I really can feel like I can tell a difference, and I like the way it kind of lists things out. I like the look of it. This mm -hmm. uh, particular theme that I have on is called Conky Sea Mod. And I That's just a gorgeous theme. It's it's not intrusive. It's uh, yeah. aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, it's very nice. It and of course it. The other thing that's great about it is unlike plasma widgets or cinnamon right. widgets or whatever right. desktop you're using, this it's at the X level, so it works on XFCE. It works on GNOME. It works on exactly. all of the different desktop environments. And so does Conky Manager. Nice. So you can set up your widgets once, and then if you like to switch around desktop which, like I do. And I do too. <laughs> it sticks with you, which is nice too. That's awesome. Yep, and so it's all set up, and of course it's open source and rocking. And you can go find Conky, you can find a link to Conky Manager. Good in stuff. The show notes. Definitely check that out, guys. Yeah. All right, Matt, before we jump Jeez. into the news, I just wanted to mention something kind of up front. Oh, yeah. Uh, this season, I think we're going to focus for the next couple of episodes a little heavy on mobile, a little heavier than we normally would. Yeah. And this showed, I don't want, I know some of you out there, um, there was a very good thread in our subreddit this week. <laughs> they love the idea. <laughs> they hate us talking about mobile. <laughs> and uh, I understand where you guys are coming from on that topic. And I want you to know this, this show isn't jumping the mobile shark and becoming the mobile action show. It's just relevant right now and particularly relevant in the Linux yep. world. And we think we've got some interesting things to contribute to that discussion. So we're going to cover it for the next Absolutely. couple of episodes. And that's not taking away from the desktop. It's just simply saying, hey, by the way, this is growing really rapidly yeah. right now. And that's it's all. time to document it and talk about yeah. it and discuss it while the irons are hot. But, we'll, you know, uh, we still got lots of great stuff in the pipeline for this season that yeah. is desktop. This is the beginning of the new season. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of great plans on stuff we're going to talk about. Good and stuff. so, you know, I just wanted to make that disclaimer because I feel your pain. I feel you. I, I know you're. Res I know what you're resisting. Well, and even some of our own gripes in you know you know will come about in the in various segments I True. Think as well. Yeah, so, you know, I, I really out. hate mobile because yeah. of blank. I mean, we'll be right there with you. Maybe after our discussion later into this episode, maybe that disclaimer will not even need to have been made. But That's I just right. thought I would make it <laughs> just okay? just in case. Yeah. Just in case. All right, Matt. Let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. Ting is wireless that makes sense. Mobile done right, Matt. My mobile service providers since the beginning of 2013. No contracts, no early termination fees, completely and truly no BS. It's true. So Go to last.ting.com. Take $25 off your service. I want to I want to share the Ting experience with Walk you for a moment. Walk me through it. Matt, Walk if I could it. paint a picture in our Theater of the Mind broadcast for you, Ting... There are a couple things they do differently over there, and I just, yep. uh, as a somebody who's been using them now since the beginning of 2013, mm -hmm. one of the things I've appreciated is their Ting blog. Yes. They just kind of keep me up to date on what my existing service is capable of, and it's kind yeah. of a nice little, like, here's a, here's a post about the HD 8XT running Windows Phone 8. If mm -hmm. I was a Windows Phone 8 user, I'd be pretty excited to right. know that's coming, right? Well, and I they, love the home phone thing. That was cool. Get your home phone and get a new yeah. home phone. Not only do they give you kind of like a, here's how you do it, here's $25 off it, but then uh, tons of links to uh, right. the Ting uh, blog on posts, on, on previous posts, or even their support forms. They have they have some active forms. Related things use. that relate to their article. Yeah. That's cool. And, uh, I, I, I just think that that's a really good indication. of somebody who's been with them for a while, it's nice to kind of stay up to date in a very mm -hmm. kind of clean method. Uh, we got a note, actually, from Spike. He wrote, and he said, I bit the bullet and bought a phone from Ting. I went big, got the Samsung Galaxy Note 2, based on the list of plan price. I'll be right. saving a boatload of money, even after paying out of hand for the device. Nice. You know, which is true, because true. the cost of that device, when you pay for it, it's like, when you, when you buy it unlocked, you are not, you don't pay for it over that two-year contract. When you get a two-year contract, you're paying for it that entire time. Like you can pay like $2,000 for some of these phones. And, you, and this way, you genuinely own the phone at a fair market value versus paying through the nostrils. So he said, uh, yeah, based on the list of plan price, he's going to save a boatload. He's going to write in again to let us know how the phablet works out. He's got great sprint service in his area, so he thinks Ting's going nice. to be excellent as Super. well. Super. Yeah. You know, one of the things that Ting does, they're sort of setting the trend. They're doing it differently. Mm -hmm. If you go over to their website, last.ting.com, you can see it for yourself. You only pay for what you use. So you're not wasting your money on these big blocks of minutes that you never end up spending. Makes sense, right? Right? So they break out your rates by minutes, your text messages, your megabytes. They all put them into their bucket, and then whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you end up paying. And they've got a very easily broken out here. It's crazy super cheap. Uh, they give you a couple of different examples here. This, this guy's example account would be $33. Yeah. My account, two Ting devices on my account. Yeah, this blows my $21. mind. $21. $21. <laughs> 
that's included wow. hotspot and tethering built into the plan. And I don't have to worry, like, if one month where maybe we go out to lunch and my, my son wants to stream YouTube. Right. I don't have to worry about him bumping me into some crazy mm. plan where they charge me this insane amount per right. transfer. I just go into the next bucket. I just pay the next bucket. It's super So they roll you into the next data plan. Nice and smooth. Nice and Very nice. You can also set alerts so you get to know oh, where you're so at. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's excellent. Go check out last.ting.com and see why I love Ting so much. It's no mysterious line items on your bill. Unlimited devices on the plan. You just pay six flat dollars and you just pay for what you use. Awesome and super modern online control panel that makes it very easy to set up a new phone. And my favorite part, no hold customer support. one 855 ting ftw Anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And a real person answers the phone. Gotta love that. You real really people. do. Real people, folks. Real people, No folks. robots. So uh, go to last.ting.com. Save $25 right. off a Ting device or towards your Ting service. And thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Big thanks. All right, Matt. Yeesh. Now, this first story is our most desktop story. Yes. Then we're going to shift into mobile mode. Little mobile mode. Then we'll come up for air okay. and get back into mobile. All right, you ready? Yep, I'm, I'm really excited about this first one. It's from some folks that uh, you might be familiar with. It's called Krypton. Not the, not the Superman planet thing. Not mm -hmm. the Superman uh, uh, crystal. No, no. Yep, yep. But perhhaps... It could be kryptonite to the NSA. This is right. The project is called Krypton, and it comes from the folks behind Spider Oak, a company known for their Dropbox-like online storage synchronization service. Of course, Spider Oak differentiates itself because they encrypt locally on the client side, so not even their own admins Which can decrypt the really data. Which is really cool. And they, and they have Linux client and everything. I mean, they're a really great company. Uh, Krypton started as an internal tool that Spider Oak needed for some of its other software projects, according to their CEO, Ethan Oberman. The company wanted a way for data to be securely encrypted without the need for the user on the other end mm -hmm. to use a separate program to decrypt it. I love that. That's huge. That's huge That's because, huge. I mean, now, now the developers that want to build applications that really take care of your privacy aren't responsible for coming up with a way to do that. Right. They simply just plug this in, they're done. They, they don't have to be cryptology yeah. experts. They don't Because one of the problems is you can have a great cryptographic system, but if you don't actually understand how cryptology mm -hmm. works, you could build in flaws. I mean, we That's saw that right. happen with CryptoCat, exactly. right? So th letting somebody take care of this who's an expert in this field is, is great. Now... It's going to be a developer framework. So not only are you going to see them, Spider Oak, come out with something, but you're going to see mm -hmm. other developers create something. But the best part is, is this framework is going to be a GPL3. It's open nice. source. Nice. So we can check it. We can audit it. So Krypton is essentially a framework that allows applications to encrypt data with a web browser before it's sent to a remote server. This is a quote from the CEO. We wanted to develop more of a privacy platform for other developers and companies that can integrate directly into their applications without having to be cryptographers, Oberman said. We want people to understand the power of privacy and to understand it's not an interference and not an inhibitor to product development. That's a, what a great way to put that. Don't give people true. an excuse not to include it because exactly. it's too much work. Uh, Spider Oak plans to use Krypton for a secure instant messaging application and collaboration program they're working on internally. Mm. Oberman said, again, there's, this is Spider Oak CEO saying this, nice. Krypton will work with desktop, web, and mobile applications. Good stuff. So we're going to see, see a good encrypted uh, chat system from them. He says, uh, an early version is already up on GitHub. A more complete version should be available in about six weeks. Spider Oak plans to license it under the AGPL version 3. Open source, folks. Hey, oh, so we can trust it. Mm -hmm. Loving that. That's Big, some great news. Good stuff. They're solving a problem that everybody on the internet sort of has right now. Oh, yeah. yeah if you use the internet, you care. So... The folks behind Geek's Phone had a bit of an announcement this week. Now, you and I, we had a Geek's Phone hands-on at yeah. Linux Fest running uh, Firefox OS. That's right. And uh, the Peak Plus has been announced. This is an upgrade to an existing uh, the Peak, mm -hmm. and it sort of doubles things up. You got uh, twice the RAM. You got a, like, right. a gig now instead of 512. Uh, they're going with a 1.2 gigahertz dual-core Snapdragon S4 processor. Nice, That's right? very nice. Um, it's got it's a good 8-megapixel camera. You know, in some respects, it's similar to the previous edition. It is. Uh, you get, you, but if you are in the area... Now, I did try to pre-order one of these. However, did you really? Yeah. I didn't have a carrier that was compatible with it or whatever. Oh, I don't know what right. they're... Like, because like, I just wanted to try it. I wasn't even going to necessarily put it on cell mm -hmm. service. I just wanted to play with it. Sure. Um, but no. No, they wouldn't ship it to me. No dice. But if you are in an area that gets service, it's like 150 euros. Not bad. Yeah, it's a pretty good price. There is something interesting about this, though. There is a, there is a caveat. Yeah, I was over on the next web reading their coverage. Everybody was running stories. But oh, the yeah. next web, next web, next web, had kind of an interesting addendum at the bottom of their story. They had a good piece on it, lots of good write up about it. Um, they talked about how, uh, you know, they talked about the micro C SD slot could hold up to 32 mm -hmm. gigs, which is awesome, right? Going to include 25 gigabytes of online cloud storage. Mm -hmm. All Talks that's really cool. Yep. Talks about the HTML5 based Firefox OS a little bit in here, gives that some publicity, mm -hmm. right? 
Okay. Then at the bottom of the article, it says, after publishing this, this is on the next web.com, a Mozilla sp spokesman got in touch with the following message. Today, Geek's Phone announced a pre-sale of a new device based on boot to gecko technology. We want to clarify this is a new phone that was announced. It is based on boot to gecko technology with pre-release software, but it is not a certified or supported Firefox OS device. That's important to know because people may be buying this thinking they're getting a Firefox Right, and it's not, I don't really see that very well laid out on the uh, on It was the pretty loosely, phone. yeah, they could have elaborated a little more, yeah. I think. So I guess now we got we got the, we got the info from our chat room. But so mm -hmm. the deal is, Boot to Gecko is the underlying operating system for Firefox OS, that's right? And uh, that's what Firefox OS is going to use. That's what Geek's Phone is using. And then you have the actual like presentation layer, the GUI. Yeah, right. Firefox OS is going to do something different. Geek's Phone is doing their own thing. So really, the only differential is in fact that the top. Yeah, layer, the top layer. If you're writing an HTML5 application, you want to test in a real world mobile device. This is still going to get that job sure. done. However. Is it going to run Firefox OS two years down the road? Don't know. Man, it's hard to say. Hard to say. Uh, but it definitely lets you get your hands on it now and try things out. So that's cool, right? Very cool. I, and, I th and I think it's cool that this is out so quickly. I mean, this is right. I mean, like it was just... You know, if you would have asked me, would Firefox OS have actually been the first to market? Yeah. I, I never would have believed it. Yeah, it's I like, mean, there it is. I guess in retrospect, it kind of makes sense. It, who, you know, it would make sense it would be them, I suppose. Uh, but they got it done damn fast. They sure did. Yeah. Sure did. Good for them. Somebody else uh, got something done. Although not as fast. Not as fast, but equally as cool. The Vivaldi Project. Uh, they're shipping their testing units. This came from an update from Aaron Psycho on his Google Plus page. He says, uh, a great start to the week. Warm, mm. sunny, and quiet. <laughs> well, maybe not that quiet. <laughs> the first Vivaldi tablets, new dual-core engineering boards, and custom developer workbenches mm. were commissioned and have all been shipped out. Nice. So these are... Not like this tablet. The I had one of these. Yeah, you had one of the, yeah. one of the early ones. I yeah, think, I did. Right? Yeah. I ended up giving it to my grandpa. He loves it. Talks it's to me awesome. about it all the time. Says it's awesome. He really thinks it's great. Yeah, it was mixed. They're they're right now. I don't think this is what the KD developers are working with. I think they're literally working with workbench boards oh, yeah. that are on like a, a, a slab, and they're <laughs> hooking stuff up to it, and they're writing code. Now it's the parts, right? It's the, sure. it's the chip, just set. without the shell. Yeah. Okay. Very common with prototype, but that's I think where they're at right now. It's not like they're actually shipping tablets out to developers. Right. I don't think. Man, um, they may surprise us though. They may surprise us. It is good to see them going. And one of the things I think is interesting as we frame our Ubuntu Edge conversation going into the show is uh, they are uh, the KDE Plasma folks are taking a very different route than Canonical is. Mm -hmm. um, Canonical is is creating specific interfaces: the TV interface, the phone right. interface, the desktop interface. They're going to share a lot of code. They share the same core. But they're each different. They're each unique, sure. right? Uh, Plasma Desktop and Plasma Active sh are much more closer, much more the same thing with just a different presentation, a different approach to it. Would you say that this, uh, the, basically the KDE approach is more unified? I mean, Ubuntu is always saying how they're trying to this yeah. unified approach, but in, in reality... But then maybe, they have to go write an entire right, UI for that. Where yeah. KDE literally is more I think unified. so. I think with QML, and I think they're sharing a lot of all of the same underlying KDE technology, all right. of the applications will still talk to each other the same way they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that will also present some more rough edges. I think you're going to see sure. more desktop apps creep in to a Plasma Active experience. We'll Makes see about sense. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where you won't maybe as much in the Ubuntu Touch experience. Right. But, however, there are two very different approaches. And one, I believe, leverages existing code a little more intelligently than the other. And I don't really have much more to say than that. I just think it's interesting to frame that discussion as we move into our Ubuntu right. Edge conversation later in the show. Here is KDE mm. doing it a little bit different. Same screen. Our screen. Right, yeah. right. All right, so there you go. A little uh, progress there in that space. Now, wh one last mobile story yes. before we kind of come up for air a little bit. <laughs> the Free Software Foundation announced a fundraising program for something maybe you've never heard of before. It's and called. No, it's not an Android and roller skates. It is replica. <laughs> right. He does. Yeah, the logo is. He looks like he's like he's a He's sporty. having a good time. He's yeah. like, no NSA. No right. NSA. Yeah. Now, uh, this replicant is a free software implementation of the Android operating mm -hmm. system. And uh, they've been around for a while, but they've struggled to figure out how to take donations. I guess nobody on the project had ever heard of PayPal or Bitcoin. Well, but you got to remember that, you know, uh, they're, they're very uh, no. privacy concerned. Bitcoin. I guess. Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoin. I, do you think that would they'd be okay with that, right? Well, the Free Software Foundation takes Bitcoin, so you right. can actually donate to them with Bitcoin through the Free Software Foundation. So I don't Foundation. know why that would be confusing. But, yeah. you know, you might be asking yourself, uh, why would I want Replicant? Right. Chris, why would I want Replicant? Why would you, why? Why, help me out. Why do you want Replicant? What, what's your motivation for that over Android? I think you have to be a purist. I think you got to be like, I think you got to be, 
either a purist or a little paranoid. And I don't mean to both. I don't mean to be reductive yeah. to replicant, but I mean I I would want if I was a if I was a free software purist, I would want a free software operating system on that my makes device. Sense. You also have to worry about these devices sort of being remotely controlled. You know, True. there is another master who has root access who can send commands to your device. That's, I think, the biggest piece of all, is that if that is, in fact, a concern for you, then Replicant may make sense. Yeah. If it's not, then you don't care. I mean, you think about it right now, it seems a little silly. It seems like almost like these devices are more toyish and not worthy of the effort of something like a Replicant project. Unless you look at the sheer number of mobile users in comparison to, say, other... Uh, yeah. Means of yeah, I mean, to the internet. At, right. Android's got a larger deployment than Windows now, yeah. right? These are a very common computing platform, and it is an important space for free software. And they go everywhere with you. It's worth keeping an eye on. Now, I think privately, you know, I mean, like, just, you know, if I wasn't on the internet right now talking to people, yeah. I would, I would kind of be laughing at this saying it's not going to probably go very far. But I'm glad it's yeah. there, right? Uh, is yeah. it the herd of mobile operators? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, the heart's in the right place, but I don't see a lot of follow-through because I don't think, until you've been affected by something privacy-wise yeah. negatively, right. you don't care. You don't care. And it's not that it's not valid, it's just that that's human nature. It's like insurance. You don't think twice about yeah. it until something happens. It's right. like, oh, wait. wait right. You know? right. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, and I think that's a little unfortunate, but people who are wiser can now contribute to the project. You know, they just need to pitch it differently. They need to uh, call it replicant insurance. And then people be like, oh, yeah, I understand that concept. They should call it Google insurance. Google hey, world, insurance, yeah. You know how you're giving yourself over to this platform by a company that makes money off spying on you? Yep. We're working on your salvation. Donate to us. That could be a good pitch. Get a piece of the rock and be under the umbrella. And the whole bit, man, I'm <laughs> telling you. If you donate a certain amount, they'll yeah. send you a tinfoil hat. Absolutely, and a little plastic radio. <laughs> All right, okay. well, uh, yeah, you're, the perfect replicant device would be a mobile phone that doesn't have a GSM chip in it. It yep. just has a Wi-Fi antenna and a, a mesh networking chip, and that's Absolutely. all you get, and that's the perfect Functionality, schmunctionality, you don't need none of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so this last week, in fact, later in the show, we're going to play some clips from it. Yep. Uh, OSCON uh, was on, and uh, we don't have a lot of, there's still, like, everybody just left, and they're writing up all their stories, right. so oh, yeah, we'll probably have some more stuff in next week. We're going to have some clips mm -hmm. later in the show, but over at the App Dynamics blog, Mm -hmm. uh, I, Dustin highlighted some of his favorite talks, and he broke them out into uh, either got their slides or their video. Mm -hmm. He had a system management uh, course with Chef. There was an Adventures in Node. That's cool. A MondoDB course, yeah. how they built the community and things like that. There's uh, the art of uh, giving critiques is maybe an also a good one for some people in our audience. Oh, yes. Oh. Okay. There's a right way, and then there's a go <laughs> blankety-blank way. You know? I'm just saying. I keyed. Yes. Um, so... Anyways, just saying. we uh, went, we, this is a uh, little uh, behind the scenes thing. Uh, Matt and I are redoing the news segment. We uh, had to re-record, -re and we're just whipping through it this time. I know, we're, we're just, boom, boom. boom. Well, it's uh, like old hat for us. Yeah, exactly. We've, we've seen this. So anyways, but one thing I just wanted to recommend is uh, if, if you have a little extra time after the show, you're jonesing for a little more, we'll have a link to this in the show notes. You guys mm -hmm. can go check it out. Yep. Now, something fun to wrap up the news segment with. Matt and I are going to be judges on an open source um, contest for mm -hmm. a caption of a photo. And you might be familiar with uh, these. Uh, this is actually something that's been going on a little while. And, of course, you're also familiar with O'Reilly Media as well. Yes. But um, there is a contest going on right now where you can win, win uh, free ebooks from O'Reilly Media, probably about $500 mm -hmm. worth, free registration to LinuxCon and yep. Cloud Open Conference, and uh, also a few other goodies. And all you have to do is you take the photo that we'll have linked in the show notes. You look at that photo. You make sure you're a registered user on opensource.com. Very important. you got to go over there and register. And then uh, you post your own caption for the photo. You just look at that photo, come up with the caption, mm -hmm. send it into them. And then uh, for opensource.com, later on, Matt and I will be judging the photo submissions live. On, uh, believe it, Hangouts. Yeah. Do you remember when? I, I put it in my calendar. I put look. it in my calendar, too. Okay. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. With the, with the new baby coming up. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, we'll totally but I think it's like early. It's, it's, like, it's early August. We'll have it in the show notes for absolute positive, just because I don't want to get yeah, the wrong date. Like, I'm looking. Hold on. Let's see. It's, it's, on it's on a Monday. It's on a Monday. Yeah. yeah. It so, is on August 5th. August 5th. Yeah. We will be judging live, and you can watch us. Uh, if you're not able to get into the Hangouts themselves, you'll be able to watch it through the little YouTube feed. So. Yeah, we'll have. we'll probably mention it again beforehand. Totally. But it's cool. It's a cool way to get some free O'Reilly uh, eBooks, yeah. 500 bucks worth. And if you want to go to LinuxCon for free, I mean, that's just... right. And OpenSource.com is put on by Bing these guys. Red Hat, Red Hat, Red Hat. Yeah, and if you want us to, uh, oh my gosh, we're working with Red Hat. Oh my gosh, isn't that cool? Our secret's out. Our it's, secret it's is a secret. Out. Yep. 
I'm running Arch Linux on my Bonobo. We're working with Red Hat. You're wearing a Red Hat. I, my hat. head runs Linux. I mean, it's it's anarchy. If you know? if uh, people aren't careful, they're not going to be able to call us uh, Ubuntu fanboys I anymore. Know. I don't it's, know what's going on. We're just off the chain. It's nuts. Anyways, we'll have a link to that caption contest and information about that in the yep. show notes. And uh, you probably hear us mention it again later in Absolutely. the week. Or in the coming weeks. Yep. yep. All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. Canonical knocked my socks off, Matt. I was not huh? expecting the Ubuntu Edge Indiegogo project to launch, but they did it. They totally did it. With a goal of reaching $32 million. Million! And uh, we're going to talk about that this okay. week. We're going to get into it a little bit. I got some thoughts. You got some thoughts. I have some thoughts. First, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System 7D6, yes. creators of machines that are designed, born to run Ubuntu Linux. Right. Of course, I run Arch Linux in my Bonobo. You could really run any Linux because they are well-designed machines they that are. are that speak Linux. That's right. And I love this Ultra Pro that they put it's out. Just Look gorgeous. at this thing. This is they've answered the cries for a gorgeous right. Ultra Book that runs Linux. This thing, the Ultra Pro, is a stunner with a 14.1-inch mm. screen, 1080p IPS matte display, up to 16 gigs of RAM, and a Core i7 processor in a tiny, tiny package. Super thin. The whole package. Got yep. some video demo there. Oh, a little yeah. bit of game. Oh, yeah. I want one of these so bad. You guys got it. System 76 guys got yeah, totally, to totally. us. Yeah, totally. We've got to try this thing. Uh, this is an awesome machine. It, I love having System 76 on the show because yeah. they're perfect for you guys. They totally. are great, great hardware makers. They are great integrators. They really right. think of the product all the way from beginning to end. They want to make sure it's something that continues mm -hmm. to run. They just updated the Bonobo Extreme with yep. a brilliant update. Wants it so bad. Love my machine. Running all, run it all the time. Every day, absolutely a great workhorse. Always keeping with the trends. Recommend System76. Go to System76.com. Get, your, get yourself a machine designed to run Linux that's going to work for you out of the box. You're not going to have to hassle with compatibility. And then tell them the Linux Action Show. They last for a long time. Still got one from 2008 running like a champ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go get yourself something nice, folks. Yes. At System76.com. All right, so here we All go, right. Matt. The Good. craziness over at Canonical says, this guy say, hey, wow. I got an idea. Let's see if the community wants to put the money where their mouth is, That's and right. actually kick in. And the first day, they did something pretty cool. They did a $600 phone. Now, mm -hmm. st still way out of the, the price range for some folks. Oh, yeah. But for, um, you know, a lot but, of folks but like... for what you get, for what it is, and, you know... And a lot cost. of folks outside the U.S. pointed out that, you know, for an unlocked phone outside the U.S., that's usually what we would pay. Yeah. Uh, and if you also think about the fact that it's going to dual as a convergence device that mm -hmm. could potentially be a desktop, that's right. eh, it's a little more reasonable on the price now. Yeah. Now they've adjusted that since that six hundred dollar uh, one sold out. Yep. They now have a seven twenty five and a seven seventy five, seven eighty. It keeps going up, right? Well, and it's what really struck me is when you get into the la the last two tiers, there like are the people. 80, out there, yeah, there, there's like people donating ten grand. Yeah, four and out of like, fifty. I mean, they're right. clearly just writing a check for that. It's like holy You're right. cow. You're right. Yeah. Now there is uh, there's a lot that we do know, and there's a lot that we don't know. Right. Um, let's start with some of the stuff that we kind of know. Okay. Here's the specs. It's going to be a multi core CPU. Don't know exactly which. Not, not unreasonable for that totally not to be nailed in since this yeah. won't be shipping until May of 2014. Oh, exactly. So processes are going to change. That's right. Four gigs of RAM. Remember we were just talking mm -hmm. about that Peak Plus phone had yeah, one gig. One gig. So four yeah. versus one. Just saying. Uh, 128 gigabytes of storage. Nice. Yeah, that is really nice. And, consi and considering what they're aiming for, and we'll get into that a little later, that's the kind of specs you want. Yeah, and Shuttleworth is saying uh, in an AMA, he said uh, he, he expects it to have somewhere around... Probably eight or nine, eight to ten gigs will be used for the OS, but the rest will all be available for storage. That's cool. Four point five inch screen, seven seven twenty p sapphire crystal display. That means that. you know that means it's like I don't know. So it's on my HTC One, I think that this is Gorilla Glass. It's this right. is really good stuff. Yeah, I, it's I I don't have any scratches on this, even though it goes in my pocket mm -hmm. with my keys. Uh, I do have a cover on the back, but with sapphire crystal, like um the um iPhone five, yeah, uses that for their um. Camera cover, the glass on the right, camera, but they don't right. use it for the whole screen because you know it's very high end. Right, right. But they're talking using it for the whole glass, which is interesting. Eight megapixel camera, yeah. two megapixel front facing, dual LTE bands, mm -hmm. uh, eight hundred two eleven N, Bluetooth four, NFC, GPS, accelerometer, uh, proximity sensor, the full you, package, you know, gyros, compass, yeah. barometer, um, stereo speakers. Well, they haven't picked the speakers yet. Active noise canceling, an MHL connector, mm -hmm. so you can hook up USB devices. 
And they're working on a new silicon anode battery technology that's a little fuzzy still as well. Mm -hmm. So I think they've left some things open-ended there, as you said. So as things yeah. develop as far as technology, they can then slide in the exact specs right. on those CPU and, and whatnot. These are serious specs. Even in mm -hmm. May of 2014, I think these will still be specs that stand on their own. But they make sense as we'll get in. It might be a little more common yeah. but by, to, by then, but yeah. It's got um, a lot to do. It's got so a lot going on. So I thought, as to frame our conversation here, yeah. maybe we'd uh, listen to uh, just a couple of minutes from Mark Shuttleworth at, o at OSCon. This week, he started out, he primarily talked about Ubuntu in the cloud. I remember that's Canonical's actual moneymaker. Right. Uh, so yeah. he actually spent the majority of the talk talking about that. But he did start a little bit because they had just launched the Indiegogo campaign when uh, he was doing this. So yeah. he talks a little bit about what their uh, goals are. I think we'll use that to frame our discussion. What do you say? Cool. That's your cue, Mark. That, Mark. Mark, go. Mark. Oh, I've had problems with Mark, YouTube. YouTube for yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, go. No. Mark doesn't go. Mark doesn't go. Yeah, I've had Pro that problem. There he yeah. goes. There's Mark um, goes. I think we are uh, we're at about 4.8 or 4.9 million dollars into the campaign two days in. Um, you have helped us smash those early records. Um, and if we're able to do that, I think there are, there are a couple of really profound things uh, that come from it. One is the device itself. The device itself essentially is, is stretching what's possible in your hand to a class of computing that would traditionally have been relegated to the personal computer. So that device is the first device, and the goal is to create the first device that really does put enough RAM, enough compute, enough GPU uh, into your hand to drive a full desktop experience. Um, and it's, it's, it's accelerating innovation on a couple of other key dimensions, the, the battery um, screen and, and a couple of other interesting things. The, the, the second thing that is really interesting about it, and I think the, the more profound thing, um, is the signal that it will send to industry at large. You know, having spent the last couple of months... And I'll leave it at that. So, one, so the, the first one there is they want to create a convergent device that is a desktop and a phone in a mobile device. The second thing they want to accomplish is what he's calling send a signal to the industry that there's interest for this. Right. And they will definitely do that, I think, in a sense. But what signal do they send? Let's start with the bad. What signal mm. do they send if this fails? If they don't reach $32 million... If they don't reach $32 million, basically what's going to happen is the divide between desktop and mobile is going to remain as stark as ever. Uh, it's going to be, well, clearly they are completely separate levels of interest and completely separate purposes. It will cement that, that school of yeah. thought, won't it? It will, I think, I think the more immediate ramifications for Canonical are, the, the, so Mark says that uh, they're currently in talks with 50, quote-unquote, right. of the top mobile developers for the different platforms. Mm -hmm. That conversation probably takes a different tone if this campaign fails versus if this oh, campaign is successful, right? If you're Evernote yeah, exactly. and Shuttleworth comes to you and says, hey, we just funded uh, 32 million, we've sold 40,000 right. devices, uh, this is early days, but we've got 40,000 committed sales, would you That's be right. willing to port Evernote over to an HTML5 app or a QML mm -hmm. app? For our platform. Well, and that borrows into what I was saying uh, saying earlier is that I was talking about, someone said, well, why doesn't Mark just write a check for this? He can, he can do this without even blinking. And that's true. However, you have to understand what he was saying about actually approaching carriers. Imagine he funds this whole thing himself. He goes up to the carriers and says, I have zero sales. I have no idea if anyone's interested. Right. This is a really cool idea. Check right. it out. But doing it this way, the way he has the Indiegogo set up is that not only if it fails, does no one actually end up spending any money, but just as importantly, they're also ensuring that he has something to point to and say, we have orders sold. Right, we a fixed funding interest. campaign is an admirable you know, method to, to take. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, smart, approach. it's a really, not, not, it's not about spending money for him at all. It totally I, isn't. I think, I think it's also, um, so in the AMA that Mark did on Reddit this last week, he's mentioned that $32 million might actually be a little low. Yeah. And if they fund yeah. the $32 million and then the manufacturer comes to him and says, it's going to be $42 million. Right. Mark's got to write that check at that point, or else the thing doesn't happen, and they're on the hook for it. So Mark can't really afford to throw in now, because right. it's likely that even if this thing succeeds, he's still going to be writing a check for it, um, almost, almost for sure, exactly. in some capacity. So he said in, the, in that AMA that, I really can't afford to do it now, yep. because... For what you're saying, yeah. and because of that, and he's got, and not only that, but so he's got his own allotted amount of money for that second tier period, to where he maybe has to come up with more. Shooting that wad now is going to really blow it later on, you know. And it's not like right. he isn't already committed. And, to and they said that dollars as it is. If this fails, mm -hmm. then they will focus, and this isn't necessarily a bad plan B. They will focus on porting Ubuntu Touch over to existing right. market devices, sort of exactly. like a third-party install kind of. He's just—he's being a smart. He, honestly, as much as I rip on the guy, he's being a smart businessman in this instance. He really is.
So he, it, I think he made the right choice. It's it uh, it, it would be a record breaker if yeah. thir- if thirty two million. I think what to put it in perspective. What the largest Kickstarter is somewhere between eleven and fourteen, and that's yeah. on Kickstarter. Uh, if you go to Indiegogo's uh, most successful campaigns. One point six million dollars is like the max or something like that. So they've already broken all records on Indiegogo. If uh, and now, of course, we don't know if they'll succeed. If they do succeed, they'll break all records on any crowdfunding. Personally, just as well structured as this was, as everything's been structured so well, I'm willing to bet that they're going to peter out. They're going to hit their. T- they're going to hit just right below where they need to be. Everybody's going to be like, "Oh, it's done. They're not going to make it." I think he has a he has a press release or something up his sleeve. Some big bang to kind of shoot off at the end there mm. that's going to basically help push them over. I'm willing to bet money on it. I, I think they might have... I, I think they will. They might have misstepped on some of their initial... Um, and they sort of addressed it now with these different yeah. funding levels, but they right. they sort of had too big of a gap between the lower and the high ends, and so they saw this big drop-off. And when they restructured, yeah. they saw things pick up. I mean, right now, as we're recording the show, they're at $6.9 million, almost... Yeah. Almost at the seven million. Level. Well, and I think, but I think it's gonna, yeah, and I think it's, no matter how good or bad it is, I think it's gonna hit its peak and then it's gonna kind of start dropping off again, as you pointed out. But I think, I think they've got something else to kind of push it through. I really do, and it's really because we're a culture, geek culture, that we see something cool, we're throwing money at the screen. Yeah, and they know that. Yeah, it does. Yeah. You know, they know how to manipulate, that. and they're and that's they're, good. They're doing. I think they're doing a pretty good job of playing the PR game too. Uh, they've they've been kind of feeding information out, certain videos here uh, and there. Uh, their CEO went on CNBC. Um, the the guy that designed, or one of the main people that designed it, Chi Wong, uh, mm-hmm. did a blog post talking about his design process. Yeah. He posted uh, images of the mockups, and. Um, you know, uh, I, I, it is sort of things to whet your appetite and get you excited and see some of the thought that right. went into this device. And, and you know, th- this is really a canonical original here. And that is impressive, too. And it's actually a very good-looking device, too. They put some real forethought into the design. And, I mean, it, they re- and that's kind of their big push right now because we've all experienced the UI. We all basically get what Unity is or isn't. But I think they really put a lot of foresight into that. So I, I give them real big props for it. And yeah. I was pretty skeptical uh, initially. It's a big shock, right? But, um, you know, I'm kind of... Th- Thinking this is kind of cool, you know, it's kind of cool. I guess you, so. You, there's. It seems like. Um, do you do you want a future where this device is is powerful enough to be your desktop? And I think, I think for most of us watching this show, this device is probably never going to be it. Uh, desktops and laptops are not stopping, right? They're not getting stagnant. They're continuing to get faster. They're right. continuing to get um, smaller and and. Uh, and more capabilities, you know, sure, graphics sure. cards continue to develop. They will always, always be better than mobile devices. True. Oh, so, there's, there's more room for more power. Yeah, yeah. I, but I just think... Just like the Cray yeah. is better than my encoding rigs, right? right? Um, so I think this is probably going to end up targeting people that are... you got your early adopters that are just want it because it's cool. And then uh, later on, I think you'll get your mass market folks. Well, and I, I think mean, that's probably... And then we'll probably be kind of in the middle. you got to wonder, like, you know? okay, so... Um, you know, I was never somebody that... Uh, the netbook worked for. I just yeah, I played not, with it, yeah. but the netbook has just never been sufficient for my needs. Right. It's not enough horsepower. There are people now. Um, you might be, one of them you might be familiar with. His name is Linus Torvalds, yeah. who live on Chromebooks. Right. right? They live on Chromebooks. They live on tablets. Okay. We have members of our audience. We did the desktop submission yep. contest. We got a lot of Android desktops right. sent in. That was an eye opener for yeah, me. Yeah, it really is. People are using it as their main system now. I'm not. That person, right. I, I I need a truck, right? I, I know the old Steve Jobs car truck analogy, but it fits, right? <laughs> this I, I like a truck, and I like all of the dials that my dashboard could have. Mm-hmm. You know, I want all of my heads up displays. I want all That's my right. information. Uh, but you know, my wife, she just had our baby. She's been spending the last three days. She's only used a tablet in the last three days. Yeah, and it's it's does first, everything she wants. So like, picture like the traveling business person. You have everything on one device. You sit in. You plug in now. This is the other thing to keep in mind, which I'm kind of excited about, is the Ubuntu Edge is a Gen 1 device. Right. This is Gen 1, but Gen 2 will be a little faster. Mm-hmm. Gen 2 mm-hmm. might have wireless charging. Gen 2 might have uh, Mark. This is according to Mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might have a uh, wireless display. Right. So now you can now you can take your phone, you can set it down on a pad. You don't even have to hook up any wires. No. You got a Bluetooth keyboard, Bluetooth mouse, wireless display. That's wireless what charging. I want. Yeah. See, I want wireless. And as far as the specs are concerned, my daily desktop runs two gigs of RAM. This thing's coming with four. We're already going. I mean, I, there's that too, know, right? You know, I mean, no, I have another PC that has like twelve or whatever. But but I mean, but my daily my daily desktop that's not my media box. It, you know, it's pretty low specs. So, I mean, this is that's about where I need for most of my daily routine. I think that's the case you know? for a, a good portion of the user base. Yeah. You know. Um. And I would uh, so picture this scenario, right? You've got you've got your phone. You're working at home on a yeah, demo. Yeah. 
You get it all set up on the phone. You come into the studio. You just set the phone down on a mat, or you set exactly. it on a docking station. And I would be okay with a mat. A mat's fine. Dock, I'm not. I'm not in love with that. I don't. Well, like this the first gen is going to be yeah. a dock. And I don't sure. like the dock, but a mat would be okay. Well, what if the dock? You know? So the dock has all your wires hooked up to it. Then everything's yeah. hardwired, and you could just put the phone in it. That's all you got to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not so bad. That's not so bad. You know, I, I guess it. Yeah, that's not so bad. I guess the you know if I'm going from like multiple places and I need multiple docks, that's where it becomes kind of a hassle. Yeah, I like the wireless capacity of it because then going from like a work home situation becomes less of an issue at that point. But I think it's a cool idea, and I'm willing to choke along with it just because it's got some reasonable specs for what it is. I want to reframe the conversation a little All bit. Right. So um, Linux owns the data center. Mm -hmm. Linux owns the network space. Linux owns mobile. Yeah. I mean the kernel at Re least, realistically, right? Realistically, yeah. Um, and and uh, it's just it's growing everywhere. It has been successful in almost all fronts mm -hmm. in every aspect of computing except the desktop. Right. And if there's one man who might have insight on that, it's Mr. Linus Torvalds. That is true. So I thought we'd play a clip, and then I want to frame the, the conversation the around that. The operating system is a standard de facto for the service platforms. <laughs> That's for sure. And even nowadays, it's being used for some mobile devices and for many of network switches and so on. But it's never been, uh, never reached really an edge of being a competitor at the desktop level. Right. Why? Uh, this is my f personal failure point in Linux. That I started Linux as a desktop operating system, and it's the only area where Linux hasn't completely taken over. And that, <laughs> that just annoys the hell out of me. It's like. You said it has had some success in the mobile operating system. Google's last numbers were 900,000 new activations every day. That's not some success, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Uh, so the desktop is really hard, and I know why it's hard, and it's still annoying that the desktop is basically the last holdout. The reason the desktop is so hard to crack is most consumers do not want to install an operating system on their machine. And that's not desktop-centric. You don't want to install an operating system on your cell phone either, right? The reason Linux is successful on cell phones is not because you have 900,000 people downloading disk images and installing them on their cell phone every day. No, it's because it comes on the cell phone pre-installed. And that has never happened in the desktop market, and it's really hard to get it to happen. I mean, you, you get it, to, there have been companies that sell, like Dell, even Finland, although I know they do it in, U, in the US, but I think they do it in Finland too, that especially if you're a big business and you want to run Linux, they will pre-install Linux on your desktop. But it's something where you have to specify that you want it, and they do it for a very limited portion of their of the machines they sell. And I think he's making a great point. Mm -hmm. And I want to say uh, um, thank you to... Uh, that clip came from a talk that Linus did in 2012 at the uh, Alto University Center for Entrepreneurship. We'll have a link to that in the show notes if you guys Good want stuff. to watch more of it. And he says his argument is that uh, Linux would likely be a lot more successful if it came pre-installed. This is a new market. This is a new opportunity. And if they can get to market with a device, they do... If, if convergence is the way of the future... Not so sure I'm sold on that, but if it is the way of the future, how awesome is it that really one of the first devices attempting this is a Linux-based device? I mean, you mm -hmm. think about this should have been Apple doing this. It should right. have been Microsoft. It should have been this, right. Should have been. Yep. Really, it should have been Microsoft with Windows 8 and the Metro UI. Well, yeah, because they're coming in so late to the game yeah. that they needed to do something really yeah. different. And, compelling. They didn't. And you know, they've done parts of it like yeah. Windows Phone 8 and Windows Desktop 8 yeah. share code, but yeah. unfortunately, they're they're completely separate. But yeah, it seems like you know they really could have taken the risk in this and done it, and, and, and thankfully they haven't, because if this does work, and I think this could work for a huge majority, if you could tell, yeah. if you could tell a budget-savvy CEO, and remember, I'm thinking two, three, four generations down the line here of a device like this, because this edge like Version device, three, version four. Yeah, this yeah. is not, this edge device is not for general consumers, no. it's for enthusiasts and people who want to push the envelope, right? But I'm thinking three, four generations down the road, maybe budget-savvy CEO says, well, I'll buy that $800 smartphone or $600 smartphone, and it'll operate as my tablet, my desktop, and my phone. Right. That's and they pretty all compelling. Share, and, you know, IT can write one app that works on all of it. Right. Uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of goodness there for a potential business like that. And mm -hmm. it seems like that would have been a, a slam dunk for Microsoft to try to pull that off. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that it's... Ubuntu they fell asleep at the wheel on that yeah. one, which is good. Yeah, uh, and then I wanted to show a little bit of this clip here. This is uh, not the Edge device, 
But uh, this is uh, Victor Paul, or Palu, over at Canonical. He's showing mm -hmm. off. He This is good. I think this is a really good sign. He's been running um, Ubuntu off of his Nexus 4 for a couple of months to just kind of Interesting. learn the experience. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, dog fooding uh, is... That's like, important. Yeah. And I'm glad they're doing it. And when you look, I'm just going to jump ahead. You guys can watch the whole video on your own if you want. He's actually in this demo using um, the phone as a touchpad for the... Oh, uh, dude, yeah, that's so kind of cool. Okay, that's he, interesting. See, he's operating, with a full, he's operating with a full Ubuntu desktop, yeah. and then he's using the touchscreen of the device as that's a mouse. Cool. Now, this is running an emulation. It's, it's Ubuntu in Android, so it's like an app in Android, so the performance isn't awesome. And, and you should also point out, because someone else will, there are apps very similar to this for remote control functionality. That oh, yeah. do much. So, I mean, oh, yeah. it's not like it's, it's a just new nice. concept. But it's kind of cool it's integrated into the Ubuntu Yeah, thing, it so. is. And uh, this is on a Nexus 4. It's not yeah. on something as powerful as the Edge. Sure. Um, but out of all of the Ubuntu Touch stuff, the convergence aspect is the part that excites me the most. Right. I mean, all the other stuff is, is admirable and interesting mm -hmm. and, and, and good tech and all of that. But, all that stuff, yeah. Um, and controversial. Mm -hmm. But what impresses me is the convergence stuff. And I'm glad with the Edge device, that's what they're focusing on. So... I threw in at the six hundred dollar level. I don't wow. have I don't have the spare cash, but I just felt like, as as the wow. host here at the Linux Action Show, one of us should have it. And sure, I sure. thought, you know, what, I'll write it off as a business yeah. expense. Uh, so hopefully, I can do that. <laughs> or, or 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 you could be going. <laughs> well, or that. Too, yeah, don't right? get because yeah. they don't get the funny name. Yeah, I don't mean I don't wish them bad. No, but no, I'm no, not going to be that bummed if it doesn't succeed. Um, they already took the money. So, oh, wow. uh, but oh, wow. if okay. it's successful, I'll have one here on the show, and I'll give it a go, and I'll wow. try to run off of it. I'll try to live mm -hmm. on it for a little while and see okay. how it goes. Wow. Um, you know, I just... I, it's crazy. But if it is successful, you would get a phone. So that's kind of yeah. cool. And I think it's important to note, it can dual boot Android. So even if the Ubuntu Touch is garbage... You get a pretty cool-looking Android phone. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll throw a mod on there or something, sure. I guess. And I've played with Ubuntu Touch on uh, my uh, my Nexus. I yeah. can't remember which Nexus it was. Yeah, it was one and, of them. And, and it was... It was fine. It was fine. It had a lot of work to do, yeah. but I think it's 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 at least a competitive mobile operating. System. I think it, I think it's got a lot of potential. It's got me interested. I uh, you know I'm still not a big fan anymore of it on the desktop. It's just I've kind of moved beyond that. I you know I run it for other things, but not yeah. daily. But on the mobile, it's like you know let's they're doing some interesting things here. If they can move yeah. beyond like version two, version three, move beyond that dock. Now you got now you piqued my interest. Yeah, like, they okay. can make it all wireless. That's really that would sweet. be because that's really compelling. That's kind of if you could. I mean, think of the demo wow factor. Like if you that's could if you could I'm be saying. doing up on stage, you're up on stage and you've got you know the big screen up behind you. And you, you walk in and, and then it lights. Yeah, up. Yeah, you walk in and just set your phone down yeah. and the Ubuntu desktop right. shows up. So that's that's cool. And like wow. I said, even a mat would be. I would be cool with yeah. a mat. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Because I know they can charge stuff but, that way, yeah. right? So even, yeah, for conductive charging. But you wouldn't even have to use a mat if you're just using wide eye and. Uh, a couple of I just wanted to run down a couple of quick ten criteria for Ubuntu Edge that it okay. must meet if it's going to succeed from Tech Republic. Uh, Jack Wallen over at Tech Republic. Uh, number one, they must deliver. That's yeah. kind of like a no-brainer. Number two, it must be actually spectacular. True. Uh, it must uh, give back to certain donors. I think they're going to do important. that. That's important. It must contribute to open source. Uh, that's interesting. We'll see where that goes. Uh, I think some of it will. I, mean, I don't know how much. I, of I it. think there's going to be binary blobs involved yeah. with this, uh, and and. Um, in the uh, AMA that we'll have linked in the show sure. notes, Shuttleworth mentions that uh, you know Rev One, probably some proprietary drivers. Yeah, sure. uh, Rev Two possibly even, but Rev Three they're hoping maybe not. Uh, must be global. It must perform well as a phone. That would be helpful. <laughs> <That's> one element. <laughs> we have yeah. To otherwise it's a, otherwise it's a tablet. So yeah, that would be, that'd be helpful. Here's the number. Here's the number that would be almost number one on my list. This okay. is number seven on Tech Republic's list. It must not take away from the Ubuntu desktop. And I yeah, think, it, I think like, you can make the case it's going to. Yeah, I, oh, I think it will. I, but, well, and that's not necessarily true. I think, it, I think it will for dedicated desktop users, but I think if you're one of these phone people, you, suddenly you don't care anymore. And I think that's an interesting point that right. maybe they're banking on. Is that right. It's like, look, we've been trying to squeeze cash out of you guys ever since the beginning, and you, you folks haven't really been that helpful there. So we're gonna, we've kind of corralled you into a way to all of a sudden you're kind of you know, throwing some money our direction. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of neat because, I mean, think about it. You can have... Your desktop on on the phone like that. I, it kind of yeah. blurs the line it's to like, the point where you don't care anymore. Really. Maybe for the pure desktop enthusiast. Yeah. I, I actually, I think you and I already represent this. We've already moved. Yeah. Away. Yeah. Right. I, I you know I, I do have an Ubuntu desktop for yeah. a media box, but I don't spend my time in Ubuntu anymore. Right. I, yeah, I, I have I Ubuntu on the server. Yeah. I have Ubuntu on the server. Um. And I'm dual booting Arch and Manjaro, so you know, so kind of like me. I you know I I I I do feel bad for other Ubuntu users, yep. uh, but I think. 
there's room for Canonical to leave the Linux desktop behind and yeah. let the Linux desktop... All the other distributions are kind of pulling together in the wake, and it's actually right. kind of been improving the overall desktop. I mean, I'm running Linux kernel 3.10.3. Yeah. Uh, I got the latest system D. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to have Wayland when that ships, and I just feel like... I feel like the open source community at large is sort of rallied together in an mm. effort to sort of bring together a cohesive product exactly. as an alternative. Well, so, and, I've, and I've kind of got my brain so wrapped around System D that going to something that's not, because I don't think Ubuntu uses it. No, it uses, uses Upstart. Yeah, it yeah. uses Upstart, which I don't know anything about anymore. So it's like, you know, I've kind of already moved on. Uh, number, I'll skip ahead a couple. Number nine, yeah. it must not suffer a serious delay. That would help. I think some delay is going to be acceptable, but. And then number 10, it must have support to be completely different from anything else in the mobile community has ever seen or used because of this canonical need to be prepared to offer special official support. I think that in the spirit of community and in the, in the spirit of logistics, I think a uh, heavily moderated form would be acceptable mm -hmm. because then everybody benefits from the answers, but mm -hmm. you do need to have employees active in that form. So I think yeah. you could probably get away with that. It's interesting days. Uh, we're going to talk yeah. a little. We're going to. So we just we just saw this for the first week. We're yeah, just yeah. processing all this like you guys are. Yeah. We're going to watch the funding. And I could totally reverse myself next week. I have no idea. I think yeah. we might bring somebody on from Canonical next might week happen. and ask them some of the hard yep. questions. So right. send your questions in or your thoughts about Ubuntu Edge to Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or start a thread in our subreddit at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Yep. And uh, next week, we might throw them out a canonical employee for it. We I won't might. say which one. We might, you know. We, we probably we could just, uh, you know, it could yeah. be the little, we could have the Ubuntu logo actually sitting on a Skype call. Yeah. Wow. That'd be wild. Hmm. Little mouth. Maybe they could use that, dro uh, that uh, droid cam. That would be awesome, right, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the Linux Action Show's look at that crazy Ubuntu Edge. What? Convergence device, I guess. Convergence device, phone, tablet. Could I don't want to call it a phone. I don't either. Convergence I, device. Convergence device. <laughs>time for slash etsy and in this week's edition we'll be talking about react os a project that's been around since 1998 we've been around for years but we've never talked about it but first before we get into react os i want to thank our segment sponsor untangle untangle.com slash last you'll save 20 percent on an untangle subscription now untangle is a beautiful example of linux technology paired with ease of use combined into an amazing firewall appliance now you could go get the iso yourself and load on any box you want but this week i want to make special mention of the appliances if you work at home for a small business and you are actually doing business grade work on your internet connection consider one of these appliances if you have an office with hundreds or thousands of employees consider one of these appliances they have different appliances for each level of your need Trust me, it's so much easier when you get something here that has less moving parts it's designed to run 24 7 and do what you want and when you when you take an Untangle appliance, you can combine it with the Untangle service, and then you get excellent content filtering, spam blocking, intrusion detection, reporting, traffic prioritization, QoS, all that good stuff through an easy-to-use admin interface. That was all the heavy lifting for you. Absolutely. In good fact, stuff. you can just uh, kind of see what we're talking about by going to untangle.com slash less and clicking that download ISO link right there in the middle. It's free. Just grab it and try it out and see what you think. And then later on, if you want to add some services to it, use our code LAST20. What a great way to like take that old box that's sitting in the corner gathering dust, throw an ISO on that. See what it can do. See what it can do. Put Th it to work. Thank you, Untangle, for sponsoring mm -hmm. slash Etsy. Much appreciated. So, React OS, something designed to sort of emulate a Windows NT5X environment. So picture right. Windows 2000. To I, yeah, I, yeah, it felt uh, very much like Windows 2000. Honestly, that's okay with me. I kind of think Windows 2000 was sort of the best Windows OS that was ever released. Yeah. Um, a lot of control. Windows lot, 7 no frills. Fine, no yeah, frills. Yeah. yeah. So uh, React OS is, think of it as a, a complete compatibility environment for mm -hmm. Windows. And here, here's the install. And even the installer looks exactly oh, like yeah, Windows, Oh, yeah, totally right? does. Yeah. You got your DOS screen type installer, and then it reboots into a GUI installer, which looks just like the Windows installer. When you get to the desktop, mm -hmm. it has a new device driver found wizard. Uh, you know, the computer naming process, setting yeah, the admin yeah. password. Clearly, this is not a U.S.-based uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, there'd be a little concern there. But, yeah, yeah. it's uh, very cool, though. Yeah, uh, their office is in Moscow, but yep. their, like, build servers are in Poland. They're, like, all right. over the world. Yeah, they're a very worldwide yeah. thing. Uh, so here I have it running in VirtualBox, and um, you'll notice immediately, immediately, it looks like a Windows Classic operating environment. And it's very fast. Mm -hmm. It's very, oh, it's very, 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 very quick. And it's sort of... Um, in some ways, it's it's remarkable, and in some ways, it's a little underwhelming. It's interesting. That's a, and I use that word loosely. It's 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 definitely it was unexpectedly interesting. Yeah. I agree. I actually I see. I think I was a little more impressed than you were. 
Um, so here's here's where I see it. I see it as sort of an amazing accomplishment on its own. Oh yeah, I mean for what you got. I mean, I, and I, I and I will never use it. No, I there's uh, yeah, and we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, but yeah. It's like... uh, I think though, I picture a world of converged mobile devices, right. of cloud computing, of tablets, yeah. and of multiple different desktop operating systems. And I picture a world five, ten years down the road, maybe not even that long, where Windows is nothing more than an, the the compatibility layer you use to run your legacy applications. But you're, exactly. You're no longer, you know, and, and you're freeing yourself from this vendor lock-in that, yeah. you know, operating systems tend to lock us into. Right. So. And this gives me a platform mm -hmm. to run these legacy Win32 applications yeah. inside a Windows environment without actually having to have Windows. Which is cool. No license right. key, no fees. No, no. And sometimes you need more than just a wine emulated environment. Oh, yeah. Not emulated. Sometimes you need more than a wine translated environment. Mm -hmm. You need a full environment. And right. I, I think that's the goal ReactOS is trying to fit. Now, they've been in different incarnations since 98. They haven't been working on the same thing since 98. I mean, they initially started to do 95 compatibility. Right. <laughs> and then Microsoft switched to NT, so they switched to NT. I mean, you know, they've yeah. been around for a while. And they quite, haven't quite gotten there yet, but it's it's I, it's pre-alpha. I think they got yeah. like I mean I think they got like five ten years before they really needed. I, mean, I do. Yeah, yeah, and and hopefully they'll have moved on beyond the NT experience. But yeah, it's I, the one thing I thought was cool. All it was kind of Linux like was their application installer. I oh thought, yeah, yeah. I thought that was cool because it's like way okay. better than Add Remove Program. Yeah, I mean that that I give them points over Windows on that. So yeah. that was cool. Yeah, that I is, like that. And I uh, they've so it's it's almost you know like a Linux package manager. Too. It is. Except it just it's like it's almost got a Windows theme to it, but it's very usable. And they have it works uh, really well. They have like um uh, they have stuff written for React OS, yeah. and they also have some Windows games. Like here's Dan. Yeah, you can install right? Steam. Although should I try that? Yeah, did you try it? I could only imagine, but yeah, go <laughs> give it a whirl. So it op okay, so so it, it opened up work. the React OS Service Manager. I'll tell you, there are some of these applications yeah. are written in the original spirit of how I liked with the Windows applications before they got crappy. Right, like right, right. The right. Event Viewer is the good old school Event Viewer. Yep. It's just straight up a log viewer. I don't have to have an MFC. Exactly. I don't have to snap it in. I don't have to wait thirty seconds for the it's damn MFC there. to load. Yep. It's just instant, right? It's just reading a freaking text file. Or uh, the service manager actually is a good example too. Like it's right easy quick, to find. It's super just like, bam, quick, bam, bam. Yeah. very fast. It's like honestly, back when Windows was kind of good. But yeah, right. It's still Windows. Yeah, you yeah. know, so you didn't use it. But it was like they did. It was before the they went all Fisher Price. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, I don't. So uh, I don't think anything happened. Yeah, I can give it a try again. I don't know. See if it airs on you. I'm gonna say install, and then did now it. Did it? No, I don't think so. Now with me, I didn't see anything appear in my menu until I've uh, logged or uh, rebooted it. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hmm. I don't know. I don't. I, yeah, I'm not sure. So. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, that was because I kind of monkeyed with a few of them. I was like, why are things showing? Well, up? here's Firefox 3.6. That's hot. Yeah, fire. that installed. Now that. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's just Steam that's not installed. And they also got uh, Firefox 22 in there as well. Okay. All so right. So they got old Firefox and new Firefox. Um, I was hoping I could do like Internet Explorer, but that didn't happen. So. Oh yeah, I see. Here's my here's Firefox 22. All yeah, right, yeah. I'm gonna give that. And it start. totally works. Um, you know, first boots a little pokey, but oh, okay. So HW Killer in our chat room is saying you can go download Steam and run the installer from the Steam website, but then it doesn't run after that. Oh. You know, that's I mean, come on, okay. right? I mean, that's but look, fine. I'm getting Firefox. Which yeah, I mean, you can put in the work finally, and get the benefit. Right? Finally, I can run Firefox. Finally, absolutely. I mean, how long have we been waiting for that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this has been a huge. Yeah. This I think this is what's been holding back the Linux desktop default browser. Yeah, I mean, it's the only one, probably so. Um, yeah. Okay, so a little rendering issues too. You know, yeah, it's, it, and it's still. It's, yeah. I, I want to say it's young, but that's not entirely accurate. And it, React OS isn't young, but it's 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 definitely something to play with. It's a nice. Uh, what could be cool? Let's see, can um, I minimize? Minimize? Nope. Uh, nope. Just no. gonna lock up on. Yeah, that. I had I had it lock okay. up completely. I had to reboot it. Three they or did four do times. one thing in their reimplementation of Windows that yeah. I cannot believe Windows still has not done. Virtual freaking desktop. I know, right? They yeah. got virtual freaking yeah. desktops, oh. which is nice. They got multiple vir virtual, and it's integrated right into the start bar here, the task man. But and um, I think also a lot of the uh, the issues that we ran into, I think probably were are because we're running it on a VM. I imagine that some of these may run a little differently on a. And I'm throwing that out as a bone, out of like just trying to be a nice guy. I'm probably wrong, but but I'm <laughs> throwing that out as maybe because hmm. you know it's possible. It's possible. Now we're just we're having a little fun because yeah. I mean. Obviously, we both recognize there is some value to a project sure. like this. It's just not really in a state that most people are going to be able to use it. No, it's it's at best alpha. But you know. I love the idea that there could be a future out there where all yeah. these Win32 applications can still be used, and we don't have to have Microsoft involved mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And that, 
That is a future I think we can all get behind. Absolutely. So I say good luck to your React OS, and we'll be watching. And when you get to the point where uh, you're a little bit further along, we'll when take We're not look. shaking our hands. You've done, <laughs> yeah. it, done it right. Done yeah. it good. There you go. All right, Matt, that's the Linux Action Show's look at React OS. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Hey, Matt. Yes? Before we get out of here, why don't we do some emails? Do some emails. All right, first one comes in from David. And this actually might have been a bit message now I think about oh, it. Oh, yeah. It says, my background is in global scale data center operations. So mm. the desktop and oh. laptop remains a bit of a mystery to me. Mm. I have a tiny sub notebook that runs Linux, Lubuntu. <laughs> and I would like to run applications compartmentalized mm -hmm. to prevent unintended compiling of, capabi of capabilities or the ability to select groups of functionality. Wow, listen to these terms. Wow, some heavy stuff there. A laptop will not support Docker, and I don't want, to, I don't want the overhead of something like Oracle VirtualBox. Is user mm. mode Linux my bet? My best bet. Wow. What do you recommend? Boy. Yes. <laughs> yes? Because yeah. actually, I was going to say use Docker. Uh. So use Linux containers, yeah, yeah. use Docker. Right, uh, right. You know, user mode Linux, to root environments, all of these are probably your best. Um, I, I don't... I don't know if you, you know, so if you're a global data center guy, I mean, you know, upgrade. I don't mean to be that guy, <laughs> but use a machine that's going to accomplish what you want it to accomplish. Right. Go to system76.com and go get that ultra book. That's what I would, if I was in the market right now, that, yeah. was the machine, that would be the machine I would buy. Because then, um, you then you're not, you know, yeah. up a creek later on. So. Uh, but, you know, uh, UML or uh, to root environments. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Docker would be Docker would be perfect for you. So then you upgrade your machine, then you do Docker. All right, put your flame retardant pants on. All right. Here we go. All right, here we are. This comes in from an open source developer. Hey guys, I enjoy Atlas, Unfilter, and the Bitcoin Show Plan B. However, mm -hmm. I was disappointed in how you compared the Linux kernel to a dictatorship and like a prison. <laughs> and as an open source developer and a maintainer oh. myself, in my humble opinion, the Linux kernel development process is stuck in the 1990s. Did we call it a dictatorship in a prison? I we I said that dealing with Linus in that environment oh. is prison yard like. I don't mean that it, the, the the experience is like prison. It's just like your interaction with people in certain circumstances can be very prison yard like. He just goes on to say that uh, for one, for example, the testing process and methodology mm -hmm. is a little out of date. Automated testing acts as a buffer between contributors and developers, reducing conflict and increasing productivity. Perhaps sure. this would be something Linus could take advantage of. If Linus wants more patches with fewer bugs, maybe it's time to embrace automated testing or continuous integration as a frontline defense against stupid. Just my point oh two bit sense. From the front lines of open source. I think it sounds like great feedback, honestly. Uh, he also says, by the way, last week we mentioned uh, that DD Rescue didn't have a status update. Uh -huh. You can actually get uh, a status update by sending USR1 signal to the process. So he, oh. And he includes a little kill command uh, you can use to get the status of DD while oh, it's in score. progress. Okay. So if you DD in something, you want to know what, where it's at, yeah. we've got a command in his email. I'll find the link and it will tell you. Right how to here. Lobo writes, and I, Chris and Matt, or Lubu. It's great to watch the last show. It's packed with loads of fun and useful info, and I don't mi and I don't miss a show since nice. I discovered last. Good stuff. Uh, now he says he went back and watched the back catalog. Now I wanted to point your attention towards Aptiva's parallel board in regards to a Linux pick segment. This board is so is large to the extent it shares its identity with the Raspberry Pi and has a unique configuration and may be on the edge of future computing. It's a dual core ARM processor in conjunction right. with a 16 core Epiphany chip. Ooh. This chip hey. is the actual intellectual property of the company, and with it, the configuration has amazing power CPU cycle specs as well as raw CPU power. Nice. The company achieved their Kickstarter goal in the autumn of last year and will start shipping to their backers sometime in August. It has been made available for regular pre-orders with an October shipment for 100 bucks. You wow. basically get a Raspberry Pi with a lot of horsepower. Hmm. Now, there's some difficulties in getting your code to work on Epiphany chip, as this is the main purpose of Aptiva releasing the board at a super-duper-low super duper $99. In comparison, the equivalent to this board until now have cost around $10,000. Holy cow. And was not hence available for mortal, mortal devs with projects in the basement. <laughs> the buzz around this technology is great, and I believe the last fans may fit into the description of game-changing technology creators and adapters. Damn. Wow, that's Something cool. Something to check out. So you guys can go to aptiva.com, A-D-A-P-T-E-V-A.com. Maybe throw that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. you bet. You that's bet. That's good stuff. Absolutely. Uh, now, we're moving quick because we got a lot of emails. Yep, yep, yep. The guy writes in. Hello, Chris and Matt. First of all, I want to say thank you. I've been listening to Last and Quota Radio for a little while now, and I look forward to listening to them for years to come. Keep up the good work. It's now down to business. If I recall correctly, I think I heard that you are switching to an in-house cloud storage solution instead of Dropbox, mm -hmm. right? 
Given the storage limitations of Dropbox and my recent paranoia, cough, NSA cough, <laughs> I've decided to switch to using a home own cloud server instead of Dropbox. This decision was partly influenced by the own cloud 5 review right here on last. Right on. Here's my issue. I'd like to be able to back up the files to multiple family members in addition to myself. Is there a way to achieve this such that each user's files are kept separate? Also, I know OwnCloud has a nice GUI and all, but if I were to use, say, Debian for my server OS, is there a way I could manage OwnCloud from the command line to avoid using GUI and thus save resources? Appreciate any thoughts, hmm. suggestions, solutions. He says also from the live chat are welcome because he's probably in there right now. <laughs> um, Boy. Taking it from the end, first, uh, right. OwnCloud GUI, when it runs on the server, doesn't need a GUI. It just runs as a web application, and then you connect right. to it from your desktop to configure it. So, yeah, you're, you don't need X on your own cloud server. Good. Uh, backup. You know what I would recommend? This is just because where my head's at these days is you could try BitTorrent Sync. I was about to say that. Yeah, I was going to say BitTorrent Sync would be... I, there are a right? couple other ones, but that's like my... That would probably yeah, be where you, I'd go. You don't have any, like, cloud capacity you have to worry it's about. It's just less crap to worry about. Yeah. Just bloop, they're done. And then the to separate it, yeah. what you could do is each folder... So each each folder could be its own backup, and each folder would get its own private key, and then you share yeah, that with the go. person you want to sync to, and it would... You could just sync that, so just that folder to them. Individual private key be your differentiator. Yeah, yeah. Chat room seems like they're thinking of BitTorrent Sync as well. And I see this is kind of in the back of my mind. I'm not using OwnCloud, but I'm thinking if I do start using OwnCloud, I do think the backend data store of OwnCloud would probably sit in a BitTorrent Sync folder. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, what two complementary services to work together to accomplish a great task? Right, and then mm -hmm. you could you could also have BitTorrent Sync installed on another machine if you just want raw mm -hmm. access to the files and not go through the OwnCloud interface. Yeah. Uh, okay. John Smith writes in, Chris and Matt, I love last and recently watched some of the older episodes that I had forgot existed. <laughs> I'd like yeah. to share my thoughts on Fedora with GNOME 3, which I have found to be the exact opposite of yours. Of course, this yeah. is just my opinion and mine sure, only, sure. but I still think it's important to represent the thousands or maybe millions of people who use Fedora on a daily basis Absolutely. for production. I recently installed Fedora 19 with GNOME, and I am loving it. Some people say Fedora is Red Hat's testbed, and I still think that it's finding its, its direction. I really can't speak for the KDE side. Right. But I think where Fed what Fedora offers is a perfect out-of-the-box GNOME experience with some fixes from upstream. It's basically GNOME OS from the well-known distribution with way more stability than the current state of GNOME OS. <laughs> now, that actually makes sense to me. That actually, Now, that I can get my head around. Because before, it's like, okay, well, where does it really fit in? But yeah. as a GNOME OS, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, if you think Fedora, okay. you know, it's mostly, it's mostly vanilla upstream with some improvements. Mm -hmm. And if you install GNOME, you're kind of getting what the GNOME developers... Right. Right, and of course, Arch could be this, or Gen two could be this. Sure, absolutely. Right, but it, you but know, for people who want something a little yeah. more put together, yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. About the installer, I agree that it's hard and it's got its glitches in the Fedora eighteen release, but they really had made it a lot better in Fedora nineteen. Yeah. I think we, I think we, we, we touched on that. Yeah. yeah. Overall, I think uh, it should not be ignored. The Fedora is the best out of the box GNOME experience with cutting edge apps in the repository and plenty of stability. Sure, Red Hat sort of uses it as a preview for the next Red Hat enterprise, but many people like me love it and use it for a totally different reason. Anyways, keep up the. Good work and keep the shows coming. John cool. Smith. Good stuff. Yeah, you know, totally agree there. Um, I, I don't know if I think Fedora is the definitive GNOME experience, but I think it's becoming one of them. Well, I think he's. Or it is I, one if of you them. look at out of the box GNOME experiences. Yeah. 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 I'll give you the out of the yeah. box one. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, as far as. Because I'm, I'm not really a GNOME guy, so it's kind of hard for me to compare it to. But, you know, I'd say it's at least one of the top three. Go yeah. give you that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I agree. I mean, I'll give you a top three out-of-the-box of, GNOME experience. That's a real important differentiator, because otherwise people are going to say, well, what about Arch? Oh, Arch, yeah. I'm, okay, next email I'm from Alex. <laughs> I'm with Alex. I'm, I'm in his headspace yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. He says, uh, he says uh, SE Linux adds excellent, an excellent layer of protection. Mm -hmm. It's so helpful that it was integrated into the main Linux kernel. I recently found out that it was the work of the NSA. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if it has put a back door in Linux. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for all the excellent shows. Alex. Well, there's got to be some auditing happening someplace. So right, this is the you know, beauty of it being open code. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, because there's limitations as to what they can do in that fa facet, I think we're okay. So you think about this. Think about actually, Alex, what an amazing example that SE Linux provides to us as to the value yep. of code being open. Because you can actually have code that's been created by the world's largest spy agency and inserted into the world's largest mobile operating system now, because uh, SE Linux is now yeah. shipping an Android, right? right? And Linux, of course. And because it's open source, anyone in the world can look at that code mm -hmm. and verify for themselves that the NSA is not doing anything nefarious with that exactly. code. And I, you cannot say that about any proprietary solution that has code from the NSA in it. Now, maybe they're all absolutely above board and nothing to worry about. 
But there's just no way for us as average consumers right. to know that. And maybe if I'm some developer who works on that aspect of Windows source code in that department, in that one little area, then maybe I would know if that code in Windows talks back to the NSA. Exactly. But us out here, no way for we us to We have no know clue. That. This is a real world, beautiful example of why open source code is important, mm -hmm. not just from a freedom aspect, but from a practical security aspect. That's right. So Alex, thanks for giving me an opportunity to get on that soapbox. Definitely. All right, Matt. Well, next week, uh, we're going to uh, hopefully now. Hopefully. Uh, so, OK, let me back. Last week, I mentioned the hard drives for Jupiter initiative where uh, yes. I, I created an Amazon wish list. Oh, I remember that. Eight yeah. three terabyte hard drives mm -hmm. and an external eight bay array. By Tuesday, everything was bought. Oh, my God. I think actually the array was bought. The wow. power was bought on Wednesday. Uh, and awesome. I, they, now, they haven't shown up yet. I guess like Amazon uses super lazy shipping when you do a wish list. I'm oh, sure they probably do, yeah. Yeah, give it to them for free. Give it, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking next week in slash Etsy, we'll yeah. do the setup. I'll show the setup of the drives. And I'm going to talk about right why I went with FreeNAS in ZFS instead of Linux. That's an interesting thing. going to yeah. come clean and say, this is why. This is why. I want to hear your thoughts on the tune. Yes, I know ZFS runs on Linux. Yes, I know that. We were aware. We're, we're, yes, yeah, but we're, there's a re, there's you know method yeah. your madness. We'll talk about that next week on the Linux Action Show. Yes. So a huge thank mm -hmm. you to everyone who grabbed the drives. Uh, if on the note when you bought it, if you put your name on there, when it goes into the free NAS or box, I'm gonna label each drive with your name. So it'll, oh, that's the, cool. The person who bought the drive will have a named storage slot, and a piece of Jupiter Broadcasting will live on their hard drive. That's awesome. So uh, and you can say, hey, so and so's doing a check disk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and so's drive died. That jerk. Uh oh, uh oh, that jerk. No, really, a big sincere thank you. Uh, with the new baby arriving, we just could not afford that extra yeah. expense. But I had run out of storage, and so we were in a hard spot. And you guys came to the rescue. So really appreciate that. And we'll have some more coverage of that yes. in next week's Linux Action Show. Good stuff. All right, Matt. Well, I want to remind folks they can email us linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com or check out our subreddit and start some threads, uh, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Matt, you've got a Facebook profile. People I can do. Check out. I'm on a bit of a pause at Datamation. I'll be back in October. However, um, you can find me at Facebook. It's uh, Matt Hartley Public. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. We'll have links to that and my yep, social yep. profiles in the show notes as well as our live schedule and all of those goodies. Yes, yes, yes. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Yeah, I have to make sure there's enough headroom. Ah, it's tricky. Oh. It takes more work than you might think, people. This is true. It doesn't just auto-generate. You know? That artwork doesn't just fall out of the sky. You want to bring it? <laughs> All right, so uh, one last chance for you guys to get in first. We got 106 votes on uh, this week's straw poll. Uh, if you're just joining us a little late, assuming the Ubuntu Edge ships, yes. how long until Arch is up and running on it? That's and right. uh, the uh, link to that is uh, right now being pasted into the chat room. And you can see that uh, by Bronwyn and myself. Thank you, Bronwyn. Glad to have you here. And uh, I voted one day. I believe uh, You I think? I'm thinking more like one week. I mean, All just right. realistically. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Just because that's a fairly reasonable endeavor. Like, oh, crap. I had a crap. 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 I, like, this is gross. I probably should say this. <laughs> We're already past that. I mean, if it works, right? If it, well, I was just thinking like I could just sit on it while I'm doing the show and then just absorb caffeine via my butt. Oh, it'd be like a, um, like the uh, suicide pills, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> except in your ass. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you'd be seeing, I'd be sitting here the show and you see people go like, ah, just pop on a new pill, pop on a pill. Got to like clench a cheek and you're getting your fix, right? Yeah, all right. Chatroom says that was too far. <laughs> Chatroom says I went too far on that. All right. I just wondered. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Cheat clencher. Right. I just thought I would check. I just... <laughs> clencher. Oh, and then some of them are actually linking caffeine enema in the... Uh, <laughs> look at this. Look at this. We got a caffeine enema. Seriously. Oh, oh my God. God. I'm constantly in a state of panic that we will lose the segment now. I'm like, oh, is it good? No, it's good. Is it good? No, it's good. Just don't shake. Don't shake that. Shake it. I know, right? I know. Don't breathe on it. All right, here we go. It's the Linux Action Show. Feed that. All right. And... Uh... <laughs> 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 <laughs>